All right, with no further ado, I'd like to give a big Minnesota warm welcome to die out of Dallas, Texas. <laughs> Christy. Oh. Chris Alcock. I don't look like a Texan, do I? <laughs> <laughs> Fooled all of you. <laughs> I'm actually from uh, Long Beach, California, by the way, Dallas. I like to thank Bonnie and, and all the members of the committee that uh, arranged to have me come out. It's always an honor and privilege to be able to do stuff like this. Um, I, uh, I, I pray that I do uh, the, the God that I have a conscious relationship with as a direct result of working the steps out of this book uh, and the man who uh, I call my sponsor, my, Myers, uh, I, I hope I do them justice. Um, I, uh, so I'll talk about this. In the last week, I've been to five meetings. Uh, I am, uh, so I, 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 I believe in going through the steps every year, and uh, I finished writing an inventory uh, a few months ago, read it to eight people, and uh, I have, I, I think, six amends left from that current list. Um, Service-wise, I uh, my home group's the Frisco group uh, in Texas, and uh, I chair the Friday 7 a.m. morning meeting there, and I'm also the group conscience chairperson. And, and the reason why I'm saying all that isn't to, to tell you what a great, wonderful AA member I am. Um, I was taught that this is a spiritual program of action, and it, it doesn't matter what I stand up here and I talk about for the next hour. It, it counts what I do when I'm not here, uh, when I'm not in a meeting. Um, all the things that go on, and I wish I could take the credit for all this stuff, but I can't. I, I truly believe what it talks about on page 88, that we alcoholics are in discipline, so we let God discipline us in the simple way that, we, that they've outlined. And I, I'm the guy who cannot not drink. Uh, my, my drinking history has proved that. Um, and I, I was, uh, when Bonnie and I were talking about me coming out, I, I asked what the, the conference theme was and, it was, and she said, good orderly direction. I thought, oh, that's awesome. I got a lot of stuff I can talk about on that. And, and um, I'll start off with a story. Um, about 20 years ago, I went to a buddy of mine's house, a uh, sober guy, known him a long time, and uh, he was making a chocolate cake. Odd, but whatever. I, I know a lot of odd people. And um, <laughs> he asked me if I wanted a piece. We were talking. He finished, pulled out of the oven. I, I, I'm, I'm not a dessert guy. I, I just don't have a sweet tooth. I'd rather have fried cheese with marinara sauce on it, but he didn't have any. <laughs> So I said, sure, I'll, I'll, have a, I'll have a piece of that cake. You know, he gave it to me, and i got to tell you, it was the best chocolate cake I've ever had in my life. I, I was like, wow, this is awesome. Will you please write down the recipe for me? And he, sure, he pulls out a 3 by 5 card, and he writes down the, the, the directions, right? I'm like, awesome, I'm going to make this cake. So uh, being the good alcoholic I am, I ran home to make the cake. And uh, I'm looking at the instructions, and uh, it says two cups of flour, two cups of sugar. And uh, I don't like flour, so I'm going to have one cup of flour and three cups of sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Says two eggs. I don't like egg yolks, so I'm going to use four egg whites, right? <laughs> Quantity is the same. Why not? Says a ba uh, it says a, a bag of chocolate chips. I like chocolate, so I put two and a half bags in. <laughs> right? Um, I'm supposed to cook it in the oven uh, 30 minutes. Uh, 350 degrees, but I'm in a hurry. Uh, <laughs> so I decide to broil it <laughs> for 10 minutes. <laughs> Do you think that the cake that I pulled out of the oven was the same as the cake that he made? <laughs> Absolutely not. It's the importance of following d directions. And, and um, when I apply that to my life in AA, where do I find the directions? And, and I'm really glad uh, that, that I had the men that I had in my life to guide me through this journey who stuck to the directions of AA. 
Uh, I used to think that Alcoholics Anonymous was the meeting that I went to. When I was new, I didn't. I, I came into AA through the doors of a treatment center, and I'd never heard of AA. I was 22 years old. I was coming off a, a, a 10-month stint on a, a Skid Row in Los Angeles, and, and uh, I just wanted to not be in trouble. And I didn't know the difference between counseling session, AA meeting, sponsor, sponsor, counselor. I had no idea, and uh, I thought AA was the meeting I was sitting in. Um, to find out that AA is this book, right? The book is AA. Um, that the meetings actually got their name after the book. It talks about that in the form of the second edition. In the preface, it, it says the first portion of this volume describing the AA recovery program has been left untouched. So if I want to know what AA's program of recovery is, it's in the first portion of the book. And if I hear things that aren't of that, that's great. I, I like opinions, but what I talk about when I'm in an AA meeting is what AA has to offer. In a, a forward to the first edition says to show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. And nobody showed that to me when I first got sober. Um, uh, but I, th I think the defining page is what, what it talks about on page 29. It says, further on, clear-cut directions are given showing how we recover. Like, wow. It doesn't say in a vague, roundabout way we're going to show you how to do this. No, it says clear-cut. And I'm really glad that I had a sponsor who took me through the book word by word. We answered every question. When it asked me to do something, I did it. And, and um, I was thinking about, well, how, how do you relay this, not just to new people, but to room people? And I like, on page 18, it, it, it has this analogy of cancer. If a person has cancer, all are sorry for them, no one is angry or hurt, but not so with the alcoholic illness. And that was my experience. I don't know about you. When people had cancer, people were bringing them casseroles, and people were crying, they were so upset, and there were always people there. I got alcoholism, and nobody was bringing me a casserole. Everybody... <laughs> It's so weird because I, my life is so different because when I was drinking, people who knew me told me to shut up and leave. And today I get people who I don't even know call me, ask, ask me to come and talk. I'm like, uh, okay, I'll do that. Why not? And, and um, it's interesting because my dad passed away from cancer like 20 years ago. And, and uh, so if you have cancer, you got to go to a doctor and have a diagnosis done, Right. And then say that you've got lymphatic cancer, and they tell you the solution. Well, the solution is uh, you're going to have to have a dose of radiation, chemotherapy. We're going to have to do a, a surgery to remove uh, whatever tumors the, the, the chemotherapy doesn't get. And then depending on what happens, you may or may not have to go through chemotherapy again. And this process may kill you. But if you don't, you're going to be dead in six months. But if we're successful... The solution we have to offer, you will be able to live a totally normal life, right? Then comes the decision. I've got to decide whether or not I'm going to go through with the treatment or I'm going to live without the treatment. And if I agree to do it, then there's this course of action. And that's the exact same thing that happens in the 12 steps, right? I look at step one. It's a diagnosis. Um, so when, when, you, when you break down the first step in, in, in the big book, it, it's a, a self-diagnosis where I have to admit that I'm powerless over alcohol and that my life's unmanageable. And, and um, the first half of that step, admitting that I'm powerless, has two halves. It's, it's broken up from the doctor's opinion, page 23, is all about how am I powerless physically when it comes to alcohol? And it talks about an allergy. And when, when I first heard this term, I thought, I don't, I'm not allergic to alcohol. I'm allergic to scallops. True story. <laughs> I eat scallops. My throat swells up. And if I eat them at the wrong time of year, I could possibly die unless you got an EpiPen in your pocket. And most people don't carry that around for me, right? I, so they're talking about this allergy. I'm like, I, I, I can't relate to that. But when I look at what it talks about in the doctor's opinion, it says, we believe and so suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is the manifestation of an allergy, and the phenomenon of craving is limitless class and never occurs in the average tempered drinker. I, Dr. Silkworth, not an alcoholic, a guy who treated 41,000 alcoholics in his lifetime. It's a lot of people. Consider him an expert, right? Um, he knew that there was something more going on with an alcoholic than willpower or a moral issue and he equated to an allergy what he saw is when, when when these people drank something happened physically where their body had to have more alcohol 
And I started to relate to that. When I drink, I get real thirsty, right? I, I, I have to drink more. I'm not, it's not, I'm not drinking because it's a lovely, wonderful thing to do. I'm drinking because I've got to drink. And the word allergy, it, it, uh, the, the, it's defined as an abnormal reaction to a common substance, right? Um, and when you look at, at how I react to alcohol, it's very different from normal people. Uh, I was out to dinner uh, recently with some uh, people from work, right? You ever go to those things? I, I hate those. But I watch them drink. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> and um, grown man, a big guy, he, he ordered a glass of wine. Okay, sure, uh, whatever. And, and he gets this glass of wine, and he takes a sip of it. And he makes this wince, and he pushes it away. And I'm, I'm like, what's wrong? He says, it doesn't taste right. I'm like... What? <laughs> you, you, he said, I, I'm not going to drink. I'm like, w- 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 I, I don't relate to that. <laughs> right? Normal people, if it doesn't taste right, they don't drink it. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? I, I remember I, I, used to, I used to wake up. Well, actually, I used to come to. And uh, after a party, in, in I, I would literally take beer cans and beer bottles. I had cigarette butts in them. I'd strain through a T-shirt into a cup. Because there was no fresh beers. I, I, I'll drink what I don't care what it is. I will drink it. And, and um, that's not normal. <laughs> right? I have an abnormal reaction to a common substance. And I started to understand that. I don't drink like normal people. And it explains so many things that I could never explain before of why I don't show up for Christmas, why I let my parents down, why, why I can't keep my promises because I thought that I was a bad guy. And, and I, uh, so it, it, it started to make sense. This allergy idea, like it says, that, uh, as lame in our opinion, as what sounds to me, of course, mean little, but as ex problem drinkers, we can say that that explanation makes good sense. It explains many things that we couldn't otherwise account. I today can explain to people why I did what I did when I was drinking. Because I'm allergic. When I start to drink, I can't stop. So many people go, what's wrong with you? And I'm, I don't know. I don't care. I, 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 I don't care about Christmas. I, it was hard because I did care, but I couldn't show up. And, and people would say, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I, I, don't, I, I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with me. What's wrong with you? What? <laughs> right? And, and here's, the, here's the weird thing about the allergy piece is that you know what I don't eat? I don't eat scallops. You know why? Because I'm allergic to it. You know what I do? I drink. I'm allergic to it. I drink. It, it just it never mattered. And that's where the second half of that being powerless comes in from page uh, 23 to page 43. It, it, it switches gears on page 23. It says that the observations about being powerless physically, they're academic and pointless if a friend never takes the first drink, thereby setting the terrible cycle into motion. It's academic because it's good to know. I can explain why I do what I do, but it's pointless because if I never take a drink again, I'm never going to experience a craving. And it goes on to say that, therefore, the main problem the alcoholic centers in is mind rather than his body. And I have a brain that tells me that I'm not allergic to it. And um, so I think I was about 19, 19 years old. I went to my friend Gary's house, and we're going to pre-drink before we go to a party. I like to drink before I go drink. That's <laughs> Tell you the truth, I was drinking before I went to Gary's house, right? <laughs> I get to Gary's house, and somewhere along the line, I'm a blackout drinker. I, I, I didn't know it was a blackout. I really don't, people would say, what happened? I'm like, I don't know what happened, what happened? People used to tell me, and I thought, wow, that sounds like fun. I wish I was there. And, and uh, <laughs> I like to drive when I'm in a blackout. I don't know why, don't ask me, because I'm in a blackout, I can't tell you, but I, I, I drive. And um, one night, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but I came out of a blackout and I'm driving. And the unfortunate thing is that I, I came out of a blackout and I'm making a left-hand turn. And the very unfortunate thing is I look at my speedometer, I'm going 55. Oh, that's a sobering experience, right? And I lose control. I'm driving my little uh, Mazda RX-7. It's a little white one. And uh, I fishtail. I missed the car here. But as I fishtail, I swung around. There's this black sob turbo. And it's, I'm going to hit it. And I know. And I smash it. 
nailed it. Whole le- the whole left side of his car and left side of my I just, boom. Uh, somehow, I got my car home. Um, and I don't know if you have ever woken up after uh, what you thought was a horrible nightmare and go, thank God it was a nightmare. I grabbed my surfboard. I went downstairs in my driveway with my total car. I'm like, oh, it wasn't a nightmare. It really happened. <laughs> what am I going to do? And I'm, I'm freaking out, hit and run. And I'm, I'm like, ha, ah, ah. ha. And so I have a criminal mind. I've always been told that. I'm in my garage, and I'm looking around, and I see a big red plumber's wrench. So I grab the wrench, I grab a scotch brake pad, and I, I clean all the black paint off the side of my car. I take the red wrench, and I scrape red paint all over it. I drive to a neighboring city, and I said, hey, I was at a party last night, and when I came out, my car was hit. And the, the desk sergeant comes out, and he goes, ah, looks like a red car hit you. And I said, really? What? Man, you shouldn't be a death sergeant. You should be a detective. That's, I don't know how you knew that. And they wrote the report. So in, in my home city, they're looking for a white car that hit a black Saab Turbo. And in the neighboring city, they're looking for a red car that hit a white Mazda. Right? Scott free. So... After I left the Westminster Police Department, I went to my friend Gary's house. And you know what I did when I got there? I drank. Why? I'm an alcoholic. I I got an alcoholic brain, right? I like what it talks about on on page uh, 37. It says, whatever the precise definition of the word may be, we call this plain insanity. How can such a lack of proportion of the ability to think straight be called anything else? When it comes to alcohol, my brain doesn't work, right? I I, uh, I used to work on... uh, cars a lot um, growing up and uh, I used to work at this shop and this one guy brought in a year one Camaro he's a real cool guy he had like 20 muscle cars and he was letting some of the installers do burnouts and they brought in the shop and I got to run some wires from the engine compartment to the back and being the impatient alcoholic I am I'm, I'll just be careful and I'll, I'll run these wires and I got my arm up near the header it was hot and my arm touched it I lost some skin, and uh, uh, the, the next 10 years of my uh, mechanic career, you know I've never, ever been burned by ever, ever again? An exhaust manifold on a car. I would not touch a car unless it was cold, right? If it was slightly warm, I had other installers put fender covers along the whole exhaust manifold because I don't want to burn a little bit of skin, right? <laughs> Why is it that I will go to such great extremes to not be burned by exhaust manifold, but when it comes to alcohol, I'm burned over and over and over again, and my brain doesn't connect this stuff? It's because I have a lack of proportionate ability to think straight. When it comes to booze, my brain does not work. It doesn't think straight. And that explains why I, 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 I've had so many times where I wake up, point A, today I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to ruin my life anymore. God, I'm not going to do this. And as the hangover wears off and 12 o'clock rolls around, I eat a little bit of lunch and I finally get some food in me. Somewhere along the line, I end up at uh, 5 o'clock leaving work and now I'm thirsty, parched. And now I'm standing in line at a 7-Eleven with a 12-pack Coors Light. And I'm not quite sure how I got here, but since I'm in line, (laughs) right? Be a waste to put it back in the cooler. So... My brain just doesn't, it doesn't attach these things, and I have no power over that. Um, I, page 43, it says, once more, the alcoholic at certain times has no effective mental defense against the first drink. That Neither he nor any other human being can provide such a defense. That defense must come from a higher power. And that was real different from what I was hearing in treatment, right? Treatment was just a really bizarre experience. I, I uh, my, uh, counselor. His name was Willie. He always wore tie-dye shirts and he had rubber bands in his beard, which I thought was really weird. And (laughs) looked like he walked out of a Grateful Dead show. And one day he made all of the impatients stand up. There's like 40 of us and I'm standing in the back. And uh, 
He said, if you think of drinking, just think it through. And he made all the adults do this think it through thing. And I'm, I'm in the back, I'm going, I'm not doing that. Are you kidding me? This is what you have, $36,000 for 30 days? You're gonna tell me to think it through? Don't you think, if I could think it through, I would have thought it through before I wound up in this place? Right? And, and it talks about page 24 that, that I, I don't have, I don't have the ability to bring to mind with sufficient force and memory of suffering from of a week or a month ago. I don't have a defense, right? There are no triggers. Write down all your triggers. And I didn't understand when he said, write down, what are you talking about triggers? The things that make you drink. I'm like, it's Tuesday. I'm breathing. My, my heart's beating. What, what are you talking about making you drink? They used to talk about this halting, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. But you know what? I also drink when I'm full, happy, with people, and I just woke up. I don't... The only time it ever talks about triggers in the big book Alcoholics Anonymous is, is in To the Employers, I think page 137. It says, did a guy put his toe on the trigger of a loaded shotgun? That's the only time it talks about a trigger, right? I can relate to that. I, I don't have triggers. I, I, I will drink. You, I'm more likely to drink after winning a Powerball than I am after getting fired. You give me $120 million cash, uh, you better put some bodyguards on me, right? <laughs> so... When I start to understand that I'm powerless when it comes to that, right? There's that dash in the first step. And I, I always thought that the first step said, I admit that I'm powerless over alcohol, and that's why my life's unmanageable. That I, my life's unmanageable because of uh, my pending court dates, my family won't talk to me, all, all of these things. And that's how it's talking about the unmanageable of my life, not the unmanageable of my drinking. A dash means end a thought, start a thought. And I like how it defines it on page 44 and 45. It says that if a mere code of morals or better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, a lot of us would have covered long ago, right? That I could wish to be moral, I could wish to be philosophical comfort, and I could will these things with all my might, but the needed power isn't there. I cannot... I, I, used, to, I used to sit in meetings and people say, just do the next right thing. I'm like, what are you talking about? If I could do the next right thing, I wouldn't be in this room. I would be out there just doing the next right thing and keeping the plug in the jug and staying in the middle of some weird boat balancing on a beam. I don't know what you people mean, right? And it was so confusing. And then I started to find out, I got to do what's in the book. And, and I really believe that if you can just not drink no matter what, put the plug in the jug and do the next right thing, you're in the wrong room. This room's for the people who tried to do the next right thing and tried to just not drink no matter and failed at it, right? I think the dangerous message is when you tell a new person, just do the next right thing and just don't drink no matter what, when he fails at that, he's going to think that that's what AA has to offer and never come back. But that's not what AA says. AA says you don't have any power. You can't do this. You need God's help, right? It says on, on page 45, the lack of power is our dilemma. And I got to find a power by which I can live. And it says, well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable me to find a power greater myself that's going to solve my problem. I don't have to solve it. If I'm powerless, that means I can't control it. And I got to rely on something that can and will. And I came to believe in this power. It's, it's weird because I, I used to think that the second step was about fixing my broken Catholic relationship with God. And I would be able to believe again, right? I, I was going to be a Jesuit priest. I had made up my mind as a small child. I love God so much, I can't, I can't even express to you how much I love God and how much I want to devote my life to that. But then when you're, you live an alcoholic life and you can't do the next right thing and people are saying, what's wrong with you? I, I, I didn't have an answer. By the time I was 13, that whole dream got ripped away from me because of the way I was living. And what do you do when your dreams are gone? You survive, right? And that's all I was doing. And... Thank God that the chapter is we agnostics. It's not once agnostic. Or we used to be agnostic until we did this program. It says, no, we agnostics. We're all agnostics right now, sitting here in this room. And that's what the chapter we agnostics is trying to draw out in me. Currently, standing here sober in front of you, it's having me look at where am I deficient in God. And It was difficult because I, I, it was hard to set aside these lifelong conceptions around God and to begin looking at what you people, because you people had something going on in your lives that I didn't. Not just sobriety, 
People were happy and living productive lives. And I, I started, when I first got sober, I was going to a lot of meetings in South Central Los Angeles because I was desperate. I was desperate for the message of AA. In, in a, and you guys are familiar with South Central. Asian guys don't hang out in South Central. <laughs> Unless you own the liquor store, you don't even go to that neighborhood. But these guys were there to help me. And, and, and they were the most loving guys that I'd ever known. And I came to believe in AA, the same way I came to believe in alcohol, right? I, I saw, when I growing up, I saw my dad and my brothers drinking and my friends, they seemed to be having fun. And it was this social lubricant that I desperately needed. In, in, uh, at the age of 15, I, I uh, went to a drive-in movie theater and I, I drank three Mickey Big Mouth malt liquors in about a half hour. And I gotta tell you, I met God. I, I, I had a spiritual experience that night in the back of Tom's Volkswagen bus, right? I, I, I can't tell you what it's like to not be able to breathe and drink and go, oh, this is what it's like. <laughs> this is awesome. And it's the exact same thing in AA. I saw these guys that were living these lives, and it was so attractive to me. I'm like, well, how? How is this possible? They said, because they were able to find and maintain a relationship with God through working these 12 steps. And uh, page 52, right? It says, when we saw others solve their problems by a simple reliance on the spirit of the universe, we had to stop doubting the power of God. Our ideas didn't work, but the God idea did. And I have to start with this simple reliance. Um, I like the spirit of the universe idea. I, I, uh, so I encounter a lot of people say, well, how can you rely on something you can't explain or, or don't understand? And I'm like, hey, you're surrounded by it, right? Uh, there was one guy, I, we were outside talking about this, and I, I pointed up at that big orange yellow thing in the sky called the sun, right? I said, can you explain that thing? He said, no, I got no idea. Do you know how much you rely on that thing? It's not a light bulb. It's a gigantic nuclear explosion. The size of the sun is a mil, it's 100 million times bigger than the earth. It's literally, it's like 93 million miles away. And if the sun were to explode right now, Right now, we would know it for 8 minutes, 17 seconds. That's how it, it, the, the, the speed of light uh, 186,000 miles per second, right? We wouldn't know it. The sun is so important to us because whether you know it or not, if you don't get sunlight, you become vitamin D deficient. You'll get depressed. You get really sad, right, if the sun goes away. But there's a whole lot more going on around the sun. The sun... I don't know about you, but it, 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 it feels like Saturday night in, in Minnesota to me, right? <laughs> but did you realize that right now we're going roughly 66,000 miles per hour because the earth is moving around the sun? Right now, we're going 66,000, but I feel like I'm sitting still, don't you? <laughs> if the sun were gone, we'd be in a lot of trouble, right? It's because of... of a, Gravity. Gravity is another thing that we all rely on. How many people can explain gravity? I can't. I, what I like to do is I, I like to read things that really smart people have written down. It may, it's a big time saver. So, <laughs> right? I don't have to figure out. Albert Einstein, Albert Einstein said that gravity is, is the consequent, consequence of the curvature of time and space. Whatever that means. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what that means. I, I don't, but he's smart, right? But here's the thing about gravity. If we were to jump off of Reunion Arena in Dallas, Texas, or the tallest building in the world in Dubai, it doesn't matter where on earth you do this, gravity will pull you at a rate of 32 feet per second until you reach a terminal velocity of 200 miles per hour until you hit the ground, and you'll probably not live, right? Now, gravity doesn't care how much you know about it. Gravity doesn't care if you can explain it. Gravity doesn't care how you particularly feel about gravity. <laughs> but we all have a simple reliance upon it. I rely on gravity all the time. I don't think about it. I don't think about gravity any other time that I'm behind a podium talking about gravity, <laughs> right? It's the same way with God. God is a natural force. It, it, it talks about God is everything or he's nothing. What's my choice to be? And I don't have to be able to explain God. I just have to have a simple reliance. I rely on it. I rely on gravity to be here. When I wake up tomorrow morning, I hope to God gravity's still here. Right? And so I started to see that 
I'm not a concept guy when it comes to, I hear, I go to some of these meetings, they want to talk about their concept of God, and like, who cares? It says that I don't need to consider your concept. My own, however inadequate it is, sufficient to make the approach to affect a contact with God. Because what I'm after is a contact with God, not an idea. I used to think that AA was about blowing up my idea of God so big that it pushes out the idea of a drink. Uh-uh, that's not what it's saying. It's saying you start with, an, with your concept, and through the course of action, you remove the blocks that allow you to have a conscious relationship with it. In my consciousness, in everything I do, I can tell you about my relationship with God last night, today, in this moment, because I have a conscious relationship with him, not an idea of God. It's something that, that I carry with me and, and that it moves with me everywhere I go. And I started to see there was so much more going on with this that I came to, it's, I just have to have a simple reliance. I don't, the, the concept really doesn't matter. And it's interesting because like uh, extraterrestrials, right? If we all took out a piece of paper and a pencil and we wrote down our idea of what E.T. looks like and drew a picture of him, probably not many of our pictures would look alike. Our description is he's eight feet tall, they're really small, they got big eyes, they got no eyes, they got ears, they don't have ears, they smell like rose bushes, I don't know, I, right? But we don't have all these different ideas. But if a spaceship landed and extraterrestrials walked in, we now have a conscious relationship with them and what you wrote down really doesn't matter anymore, right? That's what this process is trying to get me. I got to start with an idea and it's sufficient to make the approach. And I take that, that belief that I have and, and I take that into making the decision, right? I got to make this decision to turn my will and my life over to God. It's not my drinking, right? Because what I started to see is that I don't have this power. I'm powerless. And I wish it was as simple as turning my drinking over to God, but it's not. I started to see that, that lack of power is my dilemma. And I, uh, I make lots of decisions throughout the day. Um, I've had a decision that I've, I've, uh, I've been making for roughly two years uh, to clean up the workbench in my garage. <laughs> and, uh, I got to tell you, almost every, every Friday night as I'm going to bed, I'm thinking, tomorrow's the day I'm going <laughs> to clean that thing up. And um, to be quite honest with you, when I was leaving to come here, I put some stuff out of the car on top of the teetering stuff on the workbench. I'm like, oh well, right? The thing with this, these decisions is if, if I make a decision to do that, but I don't follow it up with some kind of action, it's never going to happen, right? That page 62. I got to understand. So... I like that, it, that it, uh, after they the read the ABCs, uh, um, it says being convinced we're at step three. Just what do we mean by that and just what do we do? And it's got that question. A couple page later, it, it tells me exactly how and why. It says, page 62, and I, 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 I'm not kidding. I heard the other day in a meeting a guy with like 18 years say, I don't know how it works. I'm like, there's a, there's a whole chapter on it. What do you mean you don't know how? <laughs> What, what, what's your weird end game here? Who are you trying to fool? I mean, is that going to help the newcomer? You're sober 18 years. You don't know how it works. Buddy, you, maybe you should get a sponsor. I don't know. I, but it says on the bottom page 62, this is the how and why of it. Huh? It even says, here's the how. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Next, we decided, decision, that hereafter in this drama life, God's going to be the director. He's a principal. We're his agents. He's a father and we're his children. And I, that's the decision that I'm making, that if hereafter, from this point forward, when I make this decision, I'm going to seek direction from the director who is God. He is the principal. He's the boss. I'm the agent. I'm supposed to work on behalf of him. That's what an agent does. And he's the father, and I'm the child. That means i got to trust him. i got to trust God. i got to trust that he has my... It's hard because new people, they, they come in and they think that, I'm going to turn my will and life over to God. And as long as my life is heading towards that pile of money, that girl, that car, that job, 
It's God's will. And as soon as it starts to go this way, oh, they grab hold of it and they muscle it back. They go, oh, see, God's will. No, that's not. That's, I don't know what you call that. In, <laughs> I started, I had to look at my idea of what faith is. Because I always thought faith was this unknowing belief that things are going to go my way. No. Webster says that faith is loyalty. It means I'm going to go through with the process regardless of the outcome. And thank God that that's, I, if I would have gotten what I was wanting, I would have sold my life way short. And I make this decision, and I have to follow that up with a course of action. Uh, uh, bottom of page 63, it says, after the decision, next we launch on this course of vigorous action, the first of which is a personal house clean. I, I, I start on step four. And I, uh, I love inventory. I, I, I write inventory every year. I, 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 this last inventory I wrote, well, my, my first inventory I wrote, I had uh, 488 people on it. And um, <laughs> seemed like a lot. My buddy had, my buddy had 1,800. <laughs> right? It says on page 65, nothing counts but thoroughness and honesty. It says we go back through our lives. Right? I'm not afraid of inventory. The more, the more God shows me, the freer I get. And, and it says, if I make the decision that here after this drama life, God's going to be the director, I ask him for direction. i got to remember that inventory isn't Chris writing about Chris so Chris gets well. It's Chris asking God to show me what I need to see to get free. And when I ask God to bring to mind everybody that I've ever been resentful with, oh, my God, the floodgates <laughs> opened, right? Patty, third grade, pulled my pants down. Mrs. Robinson, first grade teacher, she got mad at me. I mean, all of these vomitous things came out, and I hadn't thought of these names in years. And I write down second column, what they did to me. That's always the fun column. Ah, they did this, they did that. And then I get to look at how it affected me. Ambition, pride, pocketbook, persuasion, sexual relations, security. Uh, missing one. Um, and then I got to go to the fourth column. And I, li I like the fourth column. Uh, it, it calls it the key to the future. I, I got to tell you, I, I, uh, we have this a, 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 as a topic sometimes in my home group, and um, it's a big deal. I know a lot of people who don't even know what the hell it means, but I mean, if, uh, if um, oh, I was going to say Donald Trump, but I'm not going to use that one. Um, <laughs> Tim Cook, CEO of Apple, comes up to you and says, I got the key to your future. Would you listen to him? Yeah. I'd probably write it down. What? what right? It's a very important thing. It says that the key to my future lies in this fourth column of this inventory. I remember asking my sponsor, why, why, why is the key to my future? He said, well, just think about that. When, when you're looking at your faults, your blame, your mistakes, not your part. Part's a very dangerous word for the fourth column. Because when I say part, what I'm really saying is I have a part, but that also means you got a part. And if I remember correctly, I did my part because you did your part. And had you not done your part, I would have done my part. This is all your fault. Now I remember why I'm mad, right? I'm looking for my fault, my blame, my mistake, right? And it's, it's amazing because I use that in my fifth step. Right? When I read, that's the exact nature of my wrongs, where I was selfish, self-seeking, dishonest, and afraid. I use it in six and seven because of my character defects and shortcomings. I also use it in my eight step, getting ready to go make all of my amends, right? Because that's what I'm going to make amends for. I use it in my ninth step because that is what I'm making amends for. My faults, my blame, my mistakes. I'm trying to set right these wrongs. And then steps 10 and 11, when you, when you really t tease them apart, it's nothing more than a short, it, it's a daily version of a fourth column. And I can't tell you how many times I've been in a 12-step call and used a piece of my fourth column inventory that I swore I would never tell anybody, I would take to the grave, and I use that to help a guy to see that he needs AA. There are 12 steps in AA, eight of which come from the fourth column. That's why it's the key to my future. All of my future work I do from 67 forward comes from this. My understanding of what's going on. That's why it's the key to my future and why it's so important. And it's, I, I got to follow the directions. It even says on, on page 65, it says, uh, when you're looking at the example, it says, 
our, our, our personal inventory is usually as definite as this. Definite. Usual means under normal condition, right? I'm not special. I'm not a snowflake alcoholic individual and different. No, I'm, I'm a run of the variety, got an allergy when I start. I'm going to black out and God only knows what's going to happen to me. Drunk, right? I've had these people come up to me and, and say, wow, well, you look at my four step and I look at them. I'm like, well, what is that? I mean, and I... I I, I come from a lineage where we don't care about hurting your feelings. I care more about whether an alcohol lives or dies and how you feel about what I tell you. And I say, that's not a four step. You can call it whatever you want, but that's not, it doesn't look anything like the example on page 65. If we're supposed to follow directions and it says clear cut directions are given showing how recovered and your inventory doesn't look like it does on page 65, I don't know what to tell you. Your cake's not going to come out very good. <laughs> right? <laughs> So I, 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 I write my resentment inventory. And I, get, I, get, I get a lot of freedom out of seeing. Um, I, I like page 62 talks about that our, um, our problems we think are basically of our own making. Very speculative. We think. Well, my experience is that it's not me. It's all of you. Had my dad hugged me and said he loved me, had my horror girlfriend not cheated on me, had Patty not pulled my pants down in third grade, my brothers were nice to me, I wouldn't be an alcoholic. Right? That's my experience. But they say, we think. Literally, they're planting the seed, right? And so I get to go through this process of inventory and get to see that, oh, wow, it was my fault. Right? The freeing part of that is, is I've been waiting my whole life for my girlfriend to come back and say, I'm sorry for cheating on you. My dad hugging me and saying he loved me. My brother saying, oh, we're sorry for pulling the eyes out of your stuffed animal. And then I could bless them and they go on their way and all is forgiven and all is right with the world. But what happens if these people are dead? What happens if they aren't going to say they're sorry? What if they don't care about me? Then I'm screwed because my problems are of their making. But because they're of my making, I got well regardless of what they did. I got recovered and nobody else had to change. What a miracle. I like that it talks about it on page uh, 103. It says, after all, our problems were of our own making. It went from speculative to conclusive. When I get through the process, I saw that it was me. It wasn't them. It, it's so freeing. And I, I take this inventory that I've written and I read it. I like that the inventory says person or persons, Right? I was always encouraged to read more than one person. It's weird because I went from California where you read your inventory to like eight people. I moved to Texas and they're like, you read it to who? I read it to my sponsor and then I beat him to death and I bury him in the backyard because I don't want anybody knowing that. I'm like, what are you talking about? It says right here. And I, when I tell people I read inventory to my wife, they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, it says you can read it to your wife. It says that I can't disclose anything that's going to hurt her. Right? I say those part for somebody else who'd be unaffected. But I think, the, why wouldn't I want, my wife's sober also. Why would I not want to share this journey with her? I think the reason why my wife and I have such a great relationship today is because we share all of this. We don't have a program separate. What? I don't, the program's right here. It's, it's, this is what we do. We're supposed to practice these principles in all of our affairs. This is AA, and this is home, and this is work, and then I wonder why I feel like I'm schizophrenic, because I'm this guy in AA, and this guy at home, and this guy at work. No, I'm the same guy everywhere I go. And the other great thing about reading inventory to multiple people is the more I read it, the less power it has, right? I read it once, and it, the power gets taken. I read it so when I get to amends, and I'm making amends for myself, and self-seeking, dishonest, and afraid, if I read it just one time, now this is the second time I'm looking at it, and I'm, I'm nervous. But if it's the ninth time you've talked about it, it's like, I'm comfortable and I'm relaxed. I know what I'm talking about. It's an amazing thing. It's a reason why they lay it out like this. And I, I get to go through six and seven after I read my inventories and, and, and discuss the exact nature of my wrongs. And I, I, I used to think that willingness was the key to six and seven. You got to be willing. You got to be willing means not opposed to in mind, right? But it doesn't say that. It says when ready. Right? It says that we ask God to make us willing if we're not. Being ready is the key. I, uh, my dad taught me to snow ski when I was really little, like six years old. Um, went to Mammoth Mountain. I wanted to go with him on the gondola at the very top because um, he was going to ski down uh, the cornice. And I wanted to go. I was so willing to go. So willing. We get up there and the drop off, it's about 12 feet, but in the air. Right? I'm, I'm this high. I'm I'm willing, but I'm not ready. <laughs> right? The thing is, is that after I had gotten older and I learned how to ski, and I, 
Now I'm, I'm ready. And it doesn't matter if I'm willing, right? The more ready I become, the more willing I am. So don't focus on the willing, get ready. And being ready means doing all the work in the book. I get to move on. I, I, making amends to them all, right? So I got a list of all these people. My first inventory from the 488 people, I had 355 formal amends that I saw where I'd done harm that I had to make amends to. And um, it seems like a lot, because it is, right? But I want to get free. I want what these guys have. And, and I go out and I start to make amends. And, and um, my becoming willing to make amends to them all started in the rooms of AA. It's amazing, because if you go to a meeting and you share about how bad inventory is and how horrible making amends are and how you're not going to make amends, you know who's listening to that? New people. And when new people get into inventory, they're going to hate inventory. And they're not going to make amends. And you're robbing them, right? If you're too scared or don't understand enough to make amends, say that. Don't say, I'm not gonna, I don't have to do that. The book says you got to be willing to make them all. How I became willing to make amends to them all was by looking at the people who were making all their amends, right? I love writing inventory and the freedom of, of making amends. I... I uh, my friend, I, I've got friends who went back to prison making amends. And uh, this guy got, uh, he ended up catching new cases, a direct result of amends. He did what the book says. He consulted with others. And he's going to have to go back and serve four years. Penitentiary time, right? And, and uh, I asked him, why did you do that? Why? And he said, because I would rather be a truthful man carrying the message behind the walls than a liar sitting in these rooms with you people. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> I have a hit and run that I got away with. And it's hanging over here. How do you sit in a room with these people who are facing jail making amends, and I'm not? I became willing. I did what the book said. I consulted. So I went to my attorney and said, hey, I'm, I'm about to go and cop to a hit and run that I got away with. And I'm on paper. He said, well, <laughs> you need to get bailed out. Call me. I'll come and get you. This is stupid. But you do a lot of this crazy stuff. So he's used to it. <laughs> so I drive up to the police station. I get all prayed up. I go inside. And there's the death sergeant. I don't know why they put the death sergeant elevated. I feel like I'm back in court, right? And this death sergeant looks down, and I, I, I did exactly what, what you do in a man. So I'm an alcoholic in order for me to stay sober. I cleaned the direction of my past in between my life. I saw where I caused this police department and other people harm. And I told them where I was self, self-seeking, dishonest, and afraid, and how I'd done a hit and run. And I need to find the owner of that car. And I, I, I need to make amends. And, and um, <laughs> the death sergeant, there's nobody in, 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 in the office. He goes, son... I really admire what you're doing. But we're right now in the process of computerizing all of those records. And in order for me to find out this hit and run, it's going to take me, I, it, it'll be his, and it will take him hours upon hours upon hours to track. Because I didn't even know the date of the accident. And he said, I admire what you're doing. Why don't you get the hell out of here before somebody else comes in? I was like, later. <laughs> right? Gone. Right? I got to tell you, though, that I have made amends that I like. It, it, it talks about uh, on page 77, yeah, I'm there to put my life in order, but my real purpose is to be maximum service to God and the people about me. I don't know what that's going to look like. Because I've seen people go to make amends and people get sober, right? And I'm there to put my life in order, but I'm also there to carry a message and, and to be a maximum service where God puts me. And I've faced other jail times and people have gotten sober. And... So Patty, third grade, pulled my pants down, right? On the, uh, out on, we're recess, on, I'm like, what the hell, right? <laughs> Through a series of bizarre, this is before Google and internet, we, we did things the old fashioned way with white pages, right? <laughs> friend of a friend of a friend knew where Patty was. And called Patty up, I'm 20, Four? Wow, right? And uh, I said, hey, Patty, you, 
won't remember you. My name's Chris Chun. She goes, I remember you. I'm like, oh, wow, this is going to be bad. And we arranged to meet coffee. And uh, I'm an alcoholic in order for me to stay sober. I cleaned the record of a past in my life where I saw it, where I caused you harm and, and, uh, and the stuff that happened when we were in third grade. And uh, I thought this was a little tiny amends. I thought she was going to hug me and say, no big deal. And um, I was waiting for the hug. And when I, when I asked her the three questions I was taught to ask, is there anything else that I've done you harm? How did all this affect you? Because I need to understand that because I think I know how stuff affects people when I have no clue. And what can I do to make it right? It was an interesting conversation because um, she told me how I ruined her childhood. And she went to years of therapy as a direct result of my, how I treated her and the reason why she pulled my pants down that day. And, and we had a really good conversation when I asked her what I could do to make it right. Out of left field, she said, I, I, I've been married for several years right now to an alcoholic who's been trying to get sober. And he's been bouncing in and out of AA for a long time. Will you please meet with him? Wow. Oh. Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> Took him to my home group. He ended up getting sober. Uh -huh. How does stuff like that happen? I hear these people say, oh, that's, that, you don't have to make that amends. What are you talking about? Don't rob people from that, right? I, I, this one guy was telling me how his sponsor said he didn't have to make amends to his ex-girlfriend. I'm like, the book says that we're supposed to. And I guarantee you the reason why that man is telling his sponsee that is because he's got amends that he needs to make to ex-girlfriends, ex-wives, and he doesn't want to make it. And rather than saying, I'm too scared to do what AA dictates, I'm going to tell you you don't have to, so I don't have to. And then people in meetings get mad at me for what I share. I've had people come up and, eh, what are you saying? Because it's right here in the book. Read it, right? Uh, this one guy said, if you ever contradict me again in a meeting, we're going to have a problem. I said, welcome, buddy. you got a problem right now. I don't know who you think I am, but I'm not that guy. I'll throw blows right here. I'm, I'm not well. <laughs> right? <laughs> I promise you, though, that I will make amends to you when it's all over. <laughs> Right? <laughs> All of my heroes have a book of knowledge in one hand and a sword in the other, and I will defend it to the death. I'm concerned about AA. I really am. I, uh, <coughs> I need all of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're a type 1 they talk about into the wives... That's great if you don't need to make amends, if you don't need to write inventory, if you don't have to do a, a moving inventory and, and do nightly reviews and upon awakenings and have service commitments and work with other alcoholics, that's great. But what happens when you sponsor a type 4 like me who drinks no matter what? And you tell him, just don't drink no matter what, right? I, I, I am here for the guys who need all of AA and I carry the message to everybody, whether you need it or not. Because that's my job. It's... It's sometimes hard. I want to be liked. I always have my whole life. I want to be liked and loved by friends and people. And, but in AA, I'd rather be effective, right? And nowadays, it's really hard, and you can't be both. You can't. My, when I talk about the book, pe people get mad at me. I'm like, I don't care if you get mad at me. I'm care I care about the new guy who needs an AA. That's why I'm here. I do a moving inventory every day. I took, I, I'm always watching out for self dishonesty resentment, and fear. And when they crop up, I ask God to remove them at once. As soon as I, I used to think that it said, when these crop up, tell God to remove it right now. It's kind of what I thought it meant. And it says, no, as soon as I recognize, I ask God to remove it. And I keep track of that stuff. And I use that stuff to feed my nightly review. And, and I, I look at, do I need to make amends? Do I need to discuss this stuff with Myers? What do I got to do? And I do my upon awakenings where I, I'm asking God to divorce me of uh, selfish or, or self-pity, dishonest, and self-seeking motives. I do all of this work because I want more God. I have to. I'm, I was told that this is about growing and understanding and effectiveness. And when that stuff crops up, it separates me from you, from God, from everything. And I like the analogy of, so when, when they talk about things cropping up and growing and understanding and effectiveness, I always relate that to, to gardening, right? Um, I like growing pot, but I won't talk about growing pot. I'll talk about growing tomatoes. Uh, <laughs> they look alike, right? So... <laughs> If you have a tomato garden and you have weeds, what do you do with them? Do you let them grow? No, you, you 
pull them is they crop up right away. And that's what I'm doing. I'm asking God to remove self dishonesty resentment, and fear when they crop up. And the reason why I'm pulling weeds from my tomato garden isn't because they're robbing nutrients from the soil. It's a lot of people think. No, because certain types of weed attract certain types of bugs. And when the weed is gone, they're going to eat your tomatoes. That's why I'm pulling these things when they crop up. It's not because it's robbing from me. It's because it attracts other stuff. And I gotta be careful of that because the other stuff that it attracts, usually right behind that's gonna be a bottle of Jack Daniels and a blackout. Probably a lot of fun that I won't remember, right? <laughs> so I, I do all of AA and I, I arrive at the 12th step. And I used to think that the 12th step was having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, somewhere between step one and step 12, I had this experience and now I'm never going to drink again, but it doesn't say spiritual experience. This is a spiritual awakening. Having had it, I woke up. I already had the experience. The experience happened my last drink because I couldn't get drunk anymore and God stopped that and he took it away from me. I can't get drunk today even if I want to. A lot of people say being powerless is drinking when you want to stay sober. And I understand that. But I've met people who wanted to get drunk and God wouldn't let that happen. That's powerless. You don't have the power to get drunk even if you want to. That's what I'm after. I want to be recovered. I want all of it. I'm, I've, I've always been that guy all the way, all in a lot. I'm, there's not a lot of gray area with me. There's just not. The life I have today is so amazing. When I submitted myself to this process and I made all of my amends, because I believe in making all of them so I can walk around a free man and not worry about who I see or what I've done. And I've got a great marriage with an outstanding woman in Alcoholics Anonymous who sponsors a dozen people, who's active in our home group. I, we have this great AA life and we've got two kids. I've got a boy who just turned six who looks just like me, but he's blonde. It's the weirdest thing. I married this Texas girl, and, and uh, it's so strange to see me, but it's blonde. I'm like, what? And I love that boy so much. I've got a two and a half year old baby girl, the first girl born in my family in 75 years. And I almost missed this whole life because of drinking, right? I have such an amazing life. It says, um, page 89, 89, nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. And, and that's what I do, right? Intensive means the limit of safety. I have to figure out how many guys I got to sponsor that will kill me and go black one click, right? <laughs> that's what you do. Intensive, man. And it's interesting, the more guys I work with, people think that that's less time I have for my life. The weird thing is, the more people I work with, the more time I have for my life. Right? My life is just so amazing. And, and to watch this fellowship grow up about me and to watch these guys get well and have these great lives and, and to be able to go to Minnesota to carry the message. <laughs> I get to go all over the place and do this stuff. My guidance counselor in high school owes me an apology. <laughs> right? You're not going to amount to anything. You're a criminal. <laughs> Well, Merry Christmas to you too, lady. I mean, I'll end with a story. I don't know where we're at time-wise. I forgot to look. But uh, blackout drinker. Uh, he's always coming in blackouts, coming out, doesn't, comes out of blackouts, doesn't know where he's at. One time he comes out of a blackout, and he's in a hole. He don't know how he got there. He's looking up. He tries to get out. He can't get out. He starts screaming for help. Help, please, somebody come and get me out of here. And his mom and dad walks up and said, what are you doing down there, son? He said, I don't know. I, got to, I came out of black. I'm stuck in a hole. Will you please help me? Please help me get out of here. So, well, if you just try harder, you can get out of there. I, I'm trying as hard as I can. They said, well, we don't know what to do. So they left. And he's stuck down in the hole. Well, thanks a lot. So he keeps screaming. And along comes a priest. Priest looks down the hole. The, oh, thank God. Will you please help me get out of here? And so the priest, he starts preaching to him. So the guy in the hole is looking up, listening to this, and all he feels is worse. He feels guiltier and guiltier as the priest keeps talking. He says, well, I can't do any of that, and the priest leaves. He starts screaming again, oh, my God, please, somebody come and help me. And all of a sudden, a doctor comes along, looks down in the hole. And says, oh, thank God, doctor, will you please get me out of this hole? He pulls out a bottle of pills and throws them down to him. <laughs> he eats the bottle of pills, right? 
He feels good, but he realizes he's still in this hole. <laughs> Help! Somebody please get me out of this hole. Along comes a recovered alcoholic. So, oh, thank you. Will you please help me get out of this hole? And the alcoholic jumps in the hole. And the guy goes, what, what are you doing now? We're both stuck in this hole. And the guy said, don't worry about it, man. I've been in this hole before. Here's a big book. It contains directions on how to get out of here. Follow me. Thanks for letting me share.